the muscles. But these are the same ones I target, like world class tarpon with when I'm going on vacation. You want to put that bait on so a lot of the bait is, is stacked up on the on the shaft of the hook, and a lot of that hook is exposed with the bait laying up by the shaft of the hook. Dang, you go deep when you when you're talking <laughs> rods. I love it. But if I'm going to go for big fish, I, I've learned to throw bigger plugs, and, and they'll produce. I mean. Hello, welcome to Fat Dad Fishing Show. My name is Rich. I am the host of this live stream slash podcast slash whatever you want to call it. Um, apologies for the mess up in times tonight. We had to advertise at eight o'clock and then YouTube was saying it's nine o'clock. So it is just after eight. We're getting it going and uh, just my apologies to everyone. So tonight we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, we were originally scheduled to have Beast Mode Charters on to talk about spring blackfish preparation. However, uh, as 2021 and 2022 are, uh, a lot of people get sick and uh, Captain Matt is under the weather and unable to come on tonight. So I'm gonna do something a little bit different and I'm gonna bring on the screen one of the co-hosts, Ed, which everybody is familiar with. Ed, good to see you. It's great to see you, Rich. How are you this week? I'm doing pretty good, doing pretty good. I'm looking forward to blackfish and I wanna introduce to everybody Mike Warner, who is uh, joining us tonight, just kind of not necessarily as a guest, but just to kind of jump in and uh, talk through black fishing. Uh, he's he's one of those guys that, I mean, he's a fishy dude. He just catches fish and he's out fish out fish me with Tog every single time I've been with him. So um, thought he'd be a good one to come on. He's also a member of the Captain Hanks Pro Staff, and he's also a member of the Fat Dad Fishing Team. So, um, welcome, Mike. Good to see you. What's going on, Rich? How are you? Um, I'm doing well. Thanks for the uh, the flexibility to jump on and and join the conversation with uh, with no prep. And then we have no problem. We of course have John Creely, uh, Creely Custom Rods. John, how are you doing tonight? What's going on, guys? How's everybody doing? Well, I'm doing good. You're gonna want to turn your mic up a little bit, I think. Yeah, uh, let's see. Get that going any better? Yep, that's a little bit better there. All right, so so we're going to jump into this episode and um, really just go through. Let's let's go through a quick a couple of quick updates because it's not the standard one with the guests, so we can all catch up with each other. Uh, and then we're going to roll into the discussion, and we're just going to try to go through everything that we can for people that are just gearing up for the opening of Blackfish in New Jersey, which is again in just about two weeks on April first. Uh, so Ed, what what do you got going on? Anything worth talking about? Not a whole lot. Uh, I got a couple orders coming through, so I'm trying to get that stuff done. And uh, other than that, I got some other stuff I'm go rolling around in the old brain. So see what we can do with that. You're doing you a know. lot of thinking. Always, always. <laughs> got to got to keep moving. Got to keep it going because if not, you know, somebody's gonna beat you to the punch. So. Yep. Exactly. Mike, how are you doing? <laughs> what What do you have going on fishing wise? <laughs> Nothing. Me and Ed went out. Called some stripers. When was that? Uh, earlier this week. Monday. Earlier this week. He outfished the hell out of me. <laughs> he had like 12. I caught seven, I think. <laughs> he did pretty good. But just waiting for the water to warm up, ready for tog, ready for just warm weather, man. Over yeah. winter. I'm, I'm right there with you, definitely. Um, and I know you go out without a dry suit, so it gets a little even even colder, especially when you're pulling in fish and you're getting wet. Every time don't, pull them don't do boat. anything I do. Yeah. <laughs> don't do anything I do. That's yeah, it. That's I, all I gotta say. I will officially advise people do not do not go out without a dry suit right now. The water temps were forty seven to fifty. It's cold. Which is still pretty cold. Uh John, how are you doing, man? All right. Is the mic any better, guys? It's a little bit better. All right. Uh that might be a problem. But anyway, uh, doing all right. We actually all got to meet up Friday, which was good to see everybody in person uh stripers did not bite unfortunately and uh foggy conditions that was a little sketchy towards the end there for me um and i got sunburned so i'm <laughs> i'm on the same boat as mike bring the warmer weather on i'm ready for todd yeah we the uh so ed and and john and i got out with our buddy randy on friday um and we were looking for striped bass, but we were not looking for river striped bass. We were looking for anything that's early migration. Uh, some of the larger fish, and we went south of, of uh, 
to the to the southern end of New Jersey, and we found them, but man, they weren't biting. Um, I had one roll of top water, um, didn't even hit it, just kind of rolled next to it. I uh, had one bite, and I think that was it for me all day. Um, definitely got some sun. I don't burn either, and I definitely got too much sun on my on my face. Uh, but I was wearing a dry suit, so everything else was good. I had no worries. Uh, so yeah, so it was it was fun, but you know we're talking this week. Um, what Sunday? We're thinking we might head out and do a river trip. So Ed and I were talking about it. So John, Mike, Randy, if you're watching or anyone else, uh, maybe we'll see you out somewhere on a river on on Sunday, uh, or maybe we can get together out there. But for me, this season, you know, I love. St- I love catching striped bass, not necessarily targeting striped bass. Um, the rivers are a little bit different because it's a, it's a bit more predictable. But I do love blackfish, and that is coming up real quick. Um, and again, we couldn't have uh, Captain Matt from uh, Beast Mode on tonight. We'll we'll get him on in a in a future show. But we can't we can't launch for. We can't we can't launch a season without talking about the the preparations and what everybody needs to think about before getting on the water. So for this one, guys, anyone in the chat, you know, leave your thoughts in there. Uh, feel free to participate as much as you can through a chat. Give your ideas, your thoughts. Uh, we see Heaven and L is in there already. James Flynn, uh, Jack West, um, and Jack is pointing out. Yes, the TV says nine o'clock, and we're starting at eight o'clock anyway. So apologies, that was my mistake. Um, we were supposed to have beast mode on tonight. We had to cancel it uh, last minute and put in a whole new one, and I screwed up the time. So it was wrong on YouTube. It was right on all the advertisements. But uh, the, so my apologies. This is the actual time. So we're we're just gonna roll with it. And uh, if anyone misses it, uh, sorry about that. But you got the replay, and this will be rebroadcast without this part on the podcast on Thursday morning at 5 a.m. So you can listen to the audio at the very least. So with that, let's jump right in and let's start talking a little bit about Blackfish and the season opener April 1st in New Jersey. I'm not sure what the days are up the coast in New York, down the coast. I think actually, I think Delaware, isn't Delaware open? Um, Uh, I'm not sure that Delaware ever actually closes. yeah. Yeah. I think yeah, they go I all thinking. year. They've got you can go catch fish in Delaware. Yeah, that's why um, that trip, that outer wall trip, I've always talked about, is always intriguing. Midsummer, you can still go. You know, June, July, May doesn't matter. Still that's go catch be, them. That's going to be crazy, and we're going to have to convince John to go with us on that. Um, and and that would be a great place. Now, so the outer wall is a, is a little bit of a pedal slash paddle offshore. Uh, I think it's what it uh, Ryan had talked about. He does the yeah, inner was, wall. He's from yeah. down there in Delaware. He it's does like two miles. I think. Oh, just shy of two miles. I think. I think yeah. it's one point eight miles from where you go out from. I think from from uh, you know Louis. If you ever take the Cape May ferry, you go right past it. Right. Cruises right. you right past that wall. And, that, and that's got to hold some really nice tog out there. Definitely some really yeah. nice flounder areas out in that in that area as well. Um, yeah. The, the concern that I would have is it is cold two miles off. Um, I wouldn't want to go with you, Mike, to be honest, unless you had a dry suit right now, but I'm down for the summer. <laughs> and we got to convince John to go out open water. Um, I'm open for open water. It's just... Uh, There's a rock wall right there the whole time. You're okay. Nah. <laughs> I'm sure, sure there'll be other boats and stuff around. I don't, I don't we'll climb on. Know. We'll be all right. <laughs> uh, yeah. You pick and choose your day. That's the biggest yeah. thing. You got to time it with the tide. You got to time with the with the wind. You can't just go on a whim and go pull something like that. It's everything's got to be right. You know, the stars have to align, so to speak. You know what I mean? Yeah, hundred percent. Especially because right. it's, it's at the bay, right? And the bay has its own well, that. Water yeah, but that's and... I mean that's a massive opening there. That's that you know those walls were built. I think that's that's what they actually call harbor of refuge. And that those walls were actually built to, you know, kind of break some of the turbulence and the yeah. and, and the waves where boats could escape and come in inside there and kind of, you know, seek refuge, so to speak. You know what I mean? So well, it, it looks like great cover. So we're going to have to try that. So let, yeah. let's let's kind of talk about that. So we already have a question in there. What's the preferred bait of choice for the spring? So let's start off with the baits. Um, 
and uh, let's kind of go around the horn. Uh, Mike, do you want to start us off? Um, same thing. The only thing, I mean, I'm I'm a sure crab guy, but one thing I notice about the spring and early is um, sometimes they want clam. I, I don't know why, but they want that softer bait. It's the only time I've ever found that you get a really good solid clam bite on tog. This is, you know, I'm I'm talking inshore, uh, inshore, inshore, like in the inlets and stuff like that. So like early season, that's the only thing I noticed. But besides that, you know, no matter what I'm doing, it it if it's um, you know, tog or or sheep's head, if I'm catching crabs, I want short crabs. That's my thing. Yeah, I, I'm right there with you. I love I love the idea of clam. Um, I mean, but the the one thing you will get at this time of the year when you're dropping for tog and you have clam on there is you will get a pretty good share of striped bass as bycatch mm -hmm. while you're fishing them, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing unless you're not using circle hooks <laughs> and then you can't keep them. But um, yeah, I, I like the idea of clam. Ed, what are you going to think about dropping down first on your first trip out? I'm with Mike shore crabs, uh, shores, greens. Um, I want to give fiddlers another shot. Um, I, n now that I'm a little bit more of a seasoned tog fisherman, I think, um, I think I want to give them another look, but you know, the, the standard. Okay. So you're not, you're, so the clam, you, you did say clam, right? I've never, I've never used oh, clam. Have. No. Okay. John, you've used clam. I assume. Right. So yeah, this is, uh, this time of year, it, it goes into a theory that I talked to a captain about anyway. Um, they're teething still. So anything hard right now, they don't really want to chew. They're going to spit out right away. So you have a tendency to see clam get bit more and, you know, the shrimp, again, back to the frozen shrimp again. I, I'm hands down a firm believer. Go get that cooked frozen shrimp and use that in the spring. I mean, again, use your crabs and everything, but you, you choose it wisely. Some days are going to be better than others with certain baits. Um, I'd say have every option open. Uh, that's what it's going to be. Um, I'm not going to use uh, the fiddlers this time of year. I feel like that that's, you know, more of a seasonal type thing. When you get towards the summertime, that might be a better bait because that's what you're seeing more of the round. Um, and the same thing with the sand fleas. I'm going to use them more in the summer when we hit back in August when it opens up. Yeah, I, I don't even know. Can you Catching fiddlers right now might be really tough. And that's why I say it, it might be better, you know, to wait until you hit that August season when we, we get back into that, that you know, area when you're going to see those type of baits in the areas. Yeah, or you could get imported ones, yeah. um, you know, if you're not catching them yourself. So, yeah, I as Heaven and Ella is saying, clam and sandworms. I, I've used sandworms in the past, uh, but not for tog, uh, but I have caught tog on them. Um, I've used them when I was bait fishing back in the day for – striped bass and i would always fish rocks you know really really heavy cover there uh which is great for the striped bass but it's also as you know the the place that you want to look for for tog um but clam definitely i'm definitely going to put clam in the mix and then uh you know then you have you have jack is mentioning blood worms and again you're going to get a huge crossover bycatch with striped bass with that so just be really careful and keep in mind the regulations when it comes to striped bass and the circle hooks that you need to use. Um, you're not going to be able to keep them if you're if you're not using a circle hook for tog. You're going to have to throw those uh, the striped bass back. But hey, if you, if you don't want to keep them, no big deal, I guess. Uh, just be real careful that you don't gut hook anything. Although you know what, let's be honest. If you're fishing for tog, you're and you're you have the bait on there you're not gut hooking a striped bass because you're going to be setting that hook the second that you feel anything on there. It's not the same as when you're striped bass fishing, you just stick it in a, a rod holder, which I think is where most of the, the gut hooks come from. You know, uh, it's very rare that something's going to be gut hooked when you're holding the rod in your hand. So just, just my thought and you're doing a, a quick, a quick set, which is what you're going to end up doing. So once a striped bass hits that, it's going to, it's going to take it just like a tog and you're going to slam that thing home. So, well, to, to touch on that real quick, though, I don't see why you couldn't keep a bass that you caught on a tog jig. I mean, I would probably maybe have a rod rigged with a circle hook on board just because. But, I mean, we catch bass on, you know, 
regular bucktails and stuff like that. They're not circle hooks. Yeah, it's but the, the it's the live bait you issue. You can't target. You right. know, you can't say, "Oh, I'm going to use a, t- a tog jig to catch a striper." But if it's bycatch, I don't know. Is that a? Yeah, nope. you can't keep it. You yeah, can't keep it if it's hooked on a, a on a non-approved method, which would be a non-circle hook. If you have any type of natural bait on a J hook or anything that's not a circle hook, even if it's an offset circle, you still can't keep it because that's not legal. It has to be an inline circle. Hmm. So right. if you drop no, down, no octopus circle hooks. Exactly. Not allowed. Right. Yeah. So you got to you. If you do catch it, you you are compelled to throw it back. Um, just because it's an illegal take at that point. Okay, so then bring a uh, a rod with a circle hook on it. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I guess so. Or just use artificials. You could use the uh, the the gulp crabs, uh, which you can catch tog on. Um, I wouldn't do it to start off the season, but I guess you you could do it. A shedder, you know, the shedder uh, mold. Mm-hmm. then you could use it on a regular tog jig and keep whatever you you know have you tried it natural the gulp crabs uh yeah i believe i've caught them on that yeah never try i never tried it yeah i don't remember god i thought i i remember last year when we had a uh discussion about this i've caught them on gulp i don't remember right and if i caught them on the gulp crabs um gulp shrimp i probably is what it was um but, you know, they will eat gulp. They're definitely right. drawn to it. I'll tell you um, what else will bite gulp is trigger fish. You can take just a piece of chunk, take your scissors and cut a chunk of gulp off, and they'll bite that, <laughs> especially, especially offshore. Flounder fishing, if you go, if you're ever flounder fishing somewhere, especially offshore, and you drop down, you feel a lot of taps, and you pull your gulp up, and you see all these little, like, half-moon-shaped bites, take perfect half-moon chunks taken out, that's trigger fish. I've had it in the bay where you go across a sod bank and all of a sudden you feel tat, 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 tat. You pull it up and you see all those perfect chunks. Looks like something with a beak took a chunk out. That's trigger fish doing that. Yeah, then it's just what size down on the hook and slam it home when you feel it. Yeah, get, yeah, snag them in the face, one or the other, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Whatever yeah, comes first. Mouth. Yeah, yeah. They, they got the real small mouth, which, which would be difficult. Um, yeah, they're tough to hook on anything smaller than a like a you know like a like a number one hook or something you know. Yeah, I mean it's like when you're blow fishing, you, you're going to have to, um, which have a similar bite. I I would say um, a bite pattern because they do have those those little beak mouths. Yeah, they'll do the same thing. Yep, you gotta you gotta slam home the small hooks in their faces. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Heaven L is is mentioning is that trigger fish or blow fish. Um, so I guess a similar bite pattern there. I'm, I'm oh, well, sure. if it's I, bi- if it's bigger, you know, it's a trigger fish. Okay. It's so that bigger the, chunk. Gotcha. Gotcha. Right. Um, all right. So, so we're all going to be looking something softer clams to start. Um, I think honestly, something like an Asian crab would work fine as well. Something that you can get naturally in the area, I think is always a good, a good bet. Now, if you're going offshore, I, I, John, what's your thought? White leggers versus greens. Does it even matter? I, I don't think it matters at this point of the year. It, it's you, they're all, you're going to be fishing more inshore again. So, uh, it doesn't matter to me. I, I mean, 90% of the time guys are using greens over whites anyway at this time of year. So, yeah. uh, again, day by day though. So we'll find out April 1st. Yeah, I guess that's the, the real thing. What are they going to eat? Um, so you're, you're heading out opening day john you're going offshore correct uh it, it all depends again our, our water temperatures seem a little higher than usual um i know once we hit that 50 degree mark you know people are going to start looking inshore more than going a little bit deeper um right. I know when we were out there in the backwaters we were seeing 50 51 so i mean at the pilings i'm sure we could have caught some already yeah that was <laughs> let's be honest that was a discussion <laughs> <laughs> we were coming in with there there were clams all over and uh john said i bet you and now john had already packed up so he wasn't going to do it and he's like i bet you you grab one of those clams and you go right over there and you're going to pull up a tog and as tempting as it was being a couple of weeks out of season it was like nah we'll just let it go for now but the water temperatures were were i was feeling positive about it you know it was now 
the warmest temperatures up around 50 were at the very end of the outgoing. Uh, and we were in an area with some very large flats. So you're talking three, four feet of water gets pretty warm and it was bright sun when it could get through the fog. Um, so it was, it was, it was, uh, it was indicating to me that we're going to get a quicker warm up, and especially, you know what, it hasn't even gotten cold since then. Yeah. So, and that was that was last Friday, and it looks like we're going to be pretty good. You know, the coldest nights are getting down to forty. Well, that's not going to do much to the water temperatures to hurt it when you're up in the sixties, seventies during the day. So, all right, so we're all going to look clam. We're going to look at the some of the the more localized hard baits like the the crabs. Um, let's talk a little bit about the gear that you're going to use. And are you going to be using the same stuff that you are now? Let's, let's start offshore. Let's talk about that first and then we'll move to the inshore stuff. Um, so John, your, your typical offshore setup is what? Okay. So, uh, for me, I run a Rye Geek 733 acid wrap rod with a, uh, Alliant 300 by Accurate, uh, 50 pound test, uh, up to 60. Uh, the leader is going to be 50 to 60 with a Belmar rig is primarily my choice um, for spinning gear. Uh, this year, I'm going to be trying out the Century Weapon Junior, which is rated quarter to one and a half. No, I can throw a two ounce on there. Um, that's seven foot as well. Uh, putting the Iowa BG 3000 on it with 30 pound lead uh, test and 30 pound leader um, using the Captain Hanks uh, jawbreaker jigs. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, guys will use the Century Pro Togger. Uh, I see a lot of guys use the Lama Glass. Um, and some guys will still break out the old musky St. Croix rods. Um, but you're looking at like your Torium 12s, your Torium 16s by Shimano, uh, Daiwa Saltiga 12s and 16s. Those are primarily going to be your reels. Any 3,000 or 4,000 reel as far as a Stratic, a Daiwa BG. Some guys are using the band Saw 50s and 75s. Uh, that's primarily where you want to stick in that offshore range. All right. Uh, so I'm trying to process all that. And <laughs> what you're basically saying is you're using, unless I miss something, you're using the same thing that you're using in the winter. Yeah hands okay. down because at it, it, this time of year this is when the big fish come to play it, this yeah. small gap is where you're gonna see double digit after double digit after double digit all right so so you're still using the the telephone poles and the tree trunk i can't say that because i'm using the same rod now so <laughs> now you use the 32 you use a 32 so it's a little more gear uh, down. i thought that's what you you said you were using now i use the 33 which is even more of a baseball bat so okay all right so I'm using the 32. Um, and I think that, you know, wh what are you, so, okay, so that's offshore. What are you using inshore? I'll still use the spitting gear. We'll still be the same way. Right. Um, as far as a conventional setup, I primarily use a bait caster more inshore. Um, so I'll use a Daiwa Alexa 300, which is overkill, but I prefer Daiwas, and those are pretty much the only bait casters they have on the market right now for what I'm looking for. Um, and I'll use the 732, which is what you got. Not saying that that can't handle a double digit tog, but it has a little more sensitivity where I can use that inshore and not, uh, you know, be afraid to use it. Right. Right. Mike, what are you going to be using it? And you're doing all inshore, correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, I fish the same things pretty much if it's any bottom fishing like that, uh, six, three to seven foot um i like the travalas i like them a lot uh six three light action 10 pound test 15 pound leader um up to the seven foot 15 pound braid uh 20 pound fluor all, all fluorocarbon leaders um and switch it uh, either you know some jigging or just a regular dropper loop um switch sometimes they don't want the jig sometimes they'll take the dropper loop just keep changing it up um, I, I prefer all spinning tackle for jigging. I don't, you know, nothing more than one ounce for me for a jig. And it's just, um, you know, it's almost like a, a finesse technique. So, you know, it's a true light tackle technique. So I always just go to the spinning and real light rods. You know what I mean? And that's, you know, 
you talk about handling a double digit fish, like a double digit tog, but like those, you know, I mean, that biggest sheet that I took last year was 14 pounds. And that was on a seven foot medium light, 15 pound braid, 20 pound test. And, you know, that's a 14 pound sheet head. So you can handle it. You know, it's just, right. is it going to break you off if it wraps up in something? Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, just it's, it's about presenting it to it. The water's moving a little bit. All that real light stuff makes a difference, especially the light line. It makes a huge difference on keeping it vertical. Yeah. I think it's important to point out a big distinction inshore versus offshore. Generally speaking, I know there's exceptions, but you're not talking the the heavy wrecks, you know, with the sharp edges all over it when you're inshore in most places. Now there are a couple of places we fish that there are, uh, but in most places you're talking about a bed of submerged rocks that have, you know, they're coming up maybe a foot. So they're, they don't have these big, crevices to to dive back into they're just kind of patrolling around rocks um unless you're right up against a jetty but then again well as a kayak guy then you just move your kayak <laughs> you know you move your kayak any direction you want and you, you have a better chance of getting it out of there so i think it is a good a good time to think about scaling down getting more sensitivity getting more feeling and as you said you can catch some really big fish on some of these lighter rods uh, Ed, you're using a lighter rod, right? Yeah, I'm. Uh, well, I do have a Creeley custom telephone pole, um, so that'll be my offshore setup. Yep. And then, um, but like inshore, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I have uh, jigging world rods, so I have the um, the Nexus. I have the spinning and the bait casting version. Um, so I'll be primarily using those. And I'm from the same school of thought of Mike. I try to use the lightest line I can. So my um, One's got 20 pound braid on it. The other one's got 15. So light line, light leader, um, you know, with the lighter line and leader, you can cut the water better. So you don't need a, you know, a giant 12 ounce weight to get to the bottom quick. You know, one ounce will do it on a, on a heavy day. So, you know, I try to, I try to keep it as light as possible. Yeah. Uh, I, I tend to do that as well to James, James's comment. How about a Creely custom pro rod, uh, so I obviously I fish with with John's rods. Um, I also have a couple others that I that I fish with, and I do tend to go lighter when I'm inshore. Um, but I'm not quite as light as Ed is when I'm using the bait casters, and it's because I use them for inshore and offshore. So I'm typically going. If you see any video of me with a bait caster, it is almost guaranteed. Uh, if it has blue line on it, that's 30 pound. It's going to be a 30 pound braid. That way I can use it offshore. You know, John makes fun of me because I go offshore with 30 pound test braid. Um, and then I'll use a 30 pound leader on that, which, you know, sometimes a 40 pound leader. But then inshore, I'll use that also for fluke. And I find that it still cuts pretty well. Um, in the deeper stuff, I may actually switch over to a spinning rod, which I never have more than 15 pound braid on and then i'll be using mainly if you see spinning rod especially with the blue line it's all 15 pound braid if it's green line it's 10 pound braid uh and and that's typically what i'm using in the back but again if i'm jigging with a conventional or with a bait caster which is actually the 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 rods that i use the most again john's rods they're creely custom rods those are going to have 30 pound braid on them so i can get the best of both worlds. And, you know, I, I've had people tell me, well, it'll break you off. You know, after we did the tog last year, people, you don't know what you're talking about. You can't pull in something that's over five pounds with that. Well, okay. I have a nine pounder to go check the video on 30 pound braid, uh, with a 20 pound leader offshore on a wreck. So it can, you can, yes, I might lose some fish. I get it. I understand. Um, but I also don't want to be fishing 40, 50 pound braid in the back. Now, Unlike John, John has a rod. For, I mean, he's a rod builder. He has a rod for every single, every single species, every single location, and the reel to go with it. So he's a little bit more specialized with his approach. I'm more of a generalist. So I, I need something that goes inshore, offshore, multi-species. And I think that's that's how Ed and uh, Mike are as well. But again, we're not rod builders. Yeah, I'm excited to get John's rod offshore to see what this thing can do. I put my uh, Avid on there, so... I'm I'm really pumped to get that thing going. I'll tell you what. I mean, you had the 
correct me if I'm wrong, John, it's identical to mine in the components, correct? It's the same exact. Yeah, they you're, basically lay out pretty much. You're going to love it. I absolutely love that thing. I yeah, can't wait. You're going to be ha- you're going to be very happy with it. It takes a little getting used to it when you come off of real light stuff because it's not it's not light. Uh, it's got a heavy backbone, but but it has the sensitivity of a light rod, which is interesting. Um, so it takes a little bit of just getting the feel down, but once you do, um, you know you're gonna you're gonna be able to you're gonna see the advantages that you have out of it. And that actually goes to a question that we have. Um, you know, if you're fishing jigs, don't you have to be on the lighter side? And I would say you don't necessarily. I mean, there's there's two things. There's a lighter rod. But then there's a more sensitive tip. Those are different. There are different things. How heavy is the rod and the backbone versus how sensitive the tip is. John, do you want to talk a little bit about that? I think this is a, a, a good thing. Actually, James, go back to uh, if you have time, go back and watch a video with Chris Balaban um, when we talk rods and reels. Um, a lot of it comes down to you know, your action of your rod. Um, when I think of tog fishing, I want moderate bass. That's just me personally. But if you go from company to company, you jump from St. Croix over to Lamaglass over to uh, Jalumas, um, moderate fast could be three different ways in each rod. Um, so would I say lighter using jigs? Yes and no. It definitely depends on your lure rating. That That's what you want to look at more than anything. Um, I like a window of half to two ounce if possible, when it comes to trying to jig. Well, you want a sensitive tip, though. Yes. Right? Yeah. So maybe... It, again, I think that comes down to, you know, the materials in the rod as well. You know, what what is that rod made out of? Um, because if I go buy an ugly stick, you know, that's rated half to two ounce, and then go buy a Jigging World Nexus that's rated half to two ounce, it's a completely different rod. Yeah, I'm looking around for the shimano corrado i have uh which is rated properly but it does not have a sensitive tip so if you're going to go out and look for it here's one thing that i have learned and i will i will tell everybody you want something where you're going to feel any movement on the end of that jig when you're going for tog you you know you, you want to know the second that thing is touched and if you have something that is too stiff in the tip um it's gonna it's just gonna make it that much harder and you know john john you were there when i was using that rod that one time and it was tough and i know i was missing hits um i was feeling it after it was dropped i wasn't feeling it when it was picked up um so it but the thing is it has a really strong backbone but the backbone is not stronger than the rod that you made for me uh so the rod that you made is actually heavier but it has a much more sensitive tip and i think that's the thing and to your point pick it up try it out you know flex the tip a little and and just make sure that you have some sensitivity there if it's too stiff you're you're just going to find yourself at a disadvantage when you're out there the one thing i can say is composite that that seems to be the way to go because you have a a fiberglass transitioning into a carbon fiber graphite tip Um, composite seems the best way to go because you have that strong backbone with a nice slender tip that's sensitive so that would be the route I would go, and it's affordable too. Yeah, what, Mike, what are you thinking about the the sensitivity of the rods? Um, it's important to have a, a rod that's got a good tip that you can feel it, or not necessarily feel it, but almost see it. Is it's more of like a a visual thing too? You know what I mean? And then a, a rod that can handle that, that kind of like backbone, you know. Um, I think like he's saying people get confused. I think when they hear like, at, like, you know, action versus like the actual, um, the power, power of the rod and, and, and the, the act, you know, the weight of the rod, meaning like lure weight versus the action. Um, uh, you know, a moderate rod is my understanding that it can kind of, uh, handle you know you can bend it more like a slow pitch rod they're moderate action you can you you know you can bend them in half but they don't have that tip that like a fast action or a fast action would have yeah like uh, my understanding is kind of like from us from a freshwater principle where like um 
rods that have a, a faster, extra fast tip or better for something that's got like a single hook or a certain like or on the surface, like a you know, like a walking bait or a frog or a plug or something like that. You want, you know, more of a fast tip and then just like a stiff rod. It doesn't bend throughout the whole rod. You know what I mean? Um, for, for tog, I feel like it's kind of, you want that cross in the middle of something that real sensitive tip, but then when you have to, you can put a lot of pressure on it and not worry about breaking it. You know what I mean? Same yeah. goes for any kind of around that heavy structure. Sometimes you just got to bulldog them out of there, you know? Yes, I think we've all been there. And, I, you know, talking about the action of the rod, the, the best way to think about it is, you know, you have different things. You have extra fast, fast, moderate, um, moderate, slow, moderate, fast. You have all of these things, right? And it really comes down to how much bend needs to go into the, will go into the rod before you start to get the power of the rod behind the bend, right? So it doesn't take much weight to bend a slow rod, a slow pitch rod, um, nearly in half. But once you start to get around half, then the power and the backbone of that rod comes in. So to set the hook with power on a slow rod, you have to set it far enough that you get that whole half of that rod bent. Mm -hmm. So so once it gets there, now it's driving the power through the, through the tip of that hook and into the mouth. Right. When you have an extra fast hook, it's very fast. It's a very fast right. set. So you can, that's where you can you know, just a twitch and you've now set the hook. Single now, hook to up water, right? Yeah. Now, now that's where it comes in. Now there's a, there's preference involved in that. Some people will absolutely swear by extra fast and fast for top waters. I personally like moderate because, uh, I have a habit and this is just me, you know, any, somebody else can be the exact opposite. I have a habit of pulling it too soon and missing the hook set. Right. Um, so the second I feel it, I'm tw I'm twitching it rather than wait waiting for the weight to settle onto that top water. So the moderate is more forgiving. So it gives me that split second extra where I'm trying to set the hook to you know make up for my you know my impatience when I'm on top water. But generally speaking, you will find in many cases some of the really best people at top water are going to be using something at the extra fast. Right, uh, right. The extra fast range with the single hooks. Well, it's like hollow body frogs. You need a stiffer rod to set that, you know, to set that hook inside of them. Where the majority of crankbait rods, where you're using treble hooks, they're moderate action because you're not really yanking that hook set as much as you're kind of sweeping into it when you feel it. You know what right. I mean? It's a right. whole. It's just a whole different. That's why, again, a good backbone is important for a good hook set on something like a tog or a sheep's head that's got a real hard mouth. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now you did say something interesting. You said something that Qua had said in the last one when talking about sheep's head, you actually watch the line. Uh, it's a visual thing for you as much as it is the feel. Oh, the same it. thing for tog too. Same thing for tog. Same thing for tog. A lot of times, like I'm not, uh, you know, Everybody, you know, sometimes I feel like when I say this stuff, because that's where I got it from, sometimes I feel like I'm quoting like Skinner when you yeah. talk about not swinging on those little tap, 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 and you're almost watching the line and like you're maintaining contact with that jig constantly. And a lot of times you lose contact and you see this slack in your line, yeah. set that hook because that's a bigger fish that picked that bait up and he's moving up towards you with it. You know what I mean? And then same time, you know, it, it, it goes for – it goes for everything like that. Sometimes you don't net like a sheep. You don't necessarily, I don't know how to put it. You don't necessarily feel it as much as you see almost. It can even be a left to right movement of the line of it kind of, you know, the line going like this, you're shifting. You're not feeling that tap, but you see that movement. That's a fish actually picking it up. You're not getting that slack because he's not coming up, but he's actually moving away with it. So you, that's why you're losing that. I, I don't know. It's a, it's a hard, it's a feeling well, or a sight. Know, it's not a, I, it's I, funny I'm a bad teacher. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's what Qua was talking about last week. He's like, you have to watch it. And he was yeah. giving the, the example of when he had, uh, he had somebody on the boat and the guy dropped the crab down. He's like, reel it up. You just missed it. Yeah. What, like, no, yeah right. Give it to he him. Reels, you got him. <laughs> he, re he reels it up and there's no more bait. He's like, right, put another right. one on, drop it down. And he's like, you missed it. <laughs> <laughs> because yep. he wasn't watching. Um, now, I will say this. I have never thought about watching the line for Tog. Ed, have you done that? Yeah. <clears throat> so you watch yep. it as well? 
Yeah, a little bit of both. I'm I'm waiting for waiting for the taps, but then I'm also watching to see what the line's doing. Um, <clears throat> my biggest fish to date is uh, six pounds. So when I caught that fish, that's what happened. He I, he didn't. There was no tap. I just saw the line because obviously the boat's anchored. I saw the line start to move, and I'm like, wait a second, something's not right. So I started to reel up on it a little bit, and then I felt the pressure, and I set the hook, and then. You know, obviously it was a battle after that, but yeah, it was, it was watching, watching the line. Hmm. All right, John, you watch the line, right? Not really. Uh, okay. I, I, I was joking because you're always talking to the guy next to you. You're always <laughs> talking to the guy next to you. Hey, pretty much. I, you know what? I, I really rarely watch the line. I probably should, but I could tell when that thing goes slack and, uh, when it, when it goes slack, that's when I just know. I don't swing on everything. I can decipher, and eh, that's a small fish. I'm not swinging on it. Eh, it's another small fish. I wait for the big one to come in, wait for that line to go slack, and then just aim for the sky. Listen, John, hook sets are free, my friend. Eh, I'm, yeah. I'm not swinging on everything. So so let's talk about the hook set. And, and I want to ask right now for Qua and Andrew, if he's still in, in the, the chat, if you guys are swinging on the first uh, for Tog, not for Sheep's Head, if you're swinging on the first movement or the first touch, uh, I can tell you I do. I swing the second I feel something, and I tend to catch a lot. Um, so I can't say that I couldn't catch more if I didn't or bigger if I didn't, but I can just say I'm not missing a ton of fish. Um, but I, I swing a lot. Um, and John, you, you do, you definitely wait. Yeah. Yeah. It, for sure. It, it's, I don't want to be sitting there wasting my time on small fish. Um, so I just wait for the bigger fish to come in. Plus if I'm swinging on everything, that means I'm going to be hooking up more on those smaller fish. Well, it goes back to what people say is if you let those small fish eat that bait, sit there and peck at it well that that big fish is going to come in and just move those smaller fish right out of the way and go to town on it yeah mike are you swinging every time no no okay. no it's like i just looked down and i just saw somebody andrew sokol said i swing when i feel the jig move and the same thing uh not on those that little tap 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 um for you know tog it, you're just you know um if it's sheep and you're you're only you know 10 15 feet down and you feel a tap tap you should probably try and swing on it because you might miss it but for tog if it's sitting dead on the bottom and it's you're you're dead sticking it on the bottom no i'm not waiting for that tap that's little fish it's a, bu a bunch of little fish will come over and check it out and create that and draw that attention of a bigger fish that's going to pick it up and he wants it and he's going to try to move it away from the competition you know and to eat it and that's what I'm, that's what I'm waiting for. That's why I say it's more of a, a sight thing for me. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, yeah, no, I, I get you. And I guess to your point, I mean, I'm not swinging when I think they're like picking at the legs, you know what I mean? But I am swinging the second, maybe it's closer to what, what Andrew is saying when the jig moves, if it's going to lift the jig at all and, and move the actual jig itself, I'm swinging. Yeah. I don't I don't care if it moves it an inch. If I just feel it, you know, pick up and move, I'm I'm setting it then. Right. Uh, I'm not doing the let's sit back and wait for a while. And but I I have seen John do that. John will John will be extremely patient on that. I I am not that guy. I'm <laughs> so I'm set, so I'm hey, definitely I'm the same way though. Him. Look, hook sets are free, like Ed said, but so are shore crabs. So, uh, you know, <laughs> I'll let them. I'll feed them all day. They're they're they can eat. <laughs> grow them you know that's a good point and, and ed you're you're saying the the hook sets are free i'm you're swinging away i'm a, I'm a quantity not quality kind of guy i'd rather go out and catch a hundred little fish than one monster i mean i i go out that fun so you know get bending the rod is is fun for me so i don't i don't care if they're you know 12 inch fish or not keepers i, I mean that's just me I hear you. I mean, it's a fun day on the water either way, right? Yeah. It's more fun for you when you when you've got the sore arm, which which I guess you know, Mike. If you go back to striped bass earlier this week with him, he was going for the numbers. You were looking for the size. 
Yeah, that's my excuse. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. One. Well, so okay. So we've we've got our our different opinions on that, which I think is great, and I think every one of us catch plenty of tog. Um, I think all of us has caught some really nice sized tog inshore and offshore when we've gone offshore. So. I guess it all works. It's it's more of a preference thing, but I think the important thing and and the chat is kind of validating this. Wait till it actually moves, rather than taps, right? So so let it go a little bit further than the taps, and uh, wait for a pronounced movement, um, whether it's lifting, so you get some slack in there, or if it if it moves off to the side, that's when it's picked it up, and that's where you should cross its eyes with a with a nice nice hook set. And and I'm actually I shouldn't say that. Are you guys crossing its eyes? Are are you really swinging hard at it, or are you just doing the old lift and reel? I'm swinging hard because Tog, you want to get them out of the rocks. You don't want to give them any opportunity they have to get get you caught up in structure. <laughs> I'm I lifting. Guess. I'm lifting. I'm lifting to make sure I still feel that weight, and I'm trying to you know think of what. I, trying to figure out how to put it I'm lifting until to make sure I still feel that weight and then I give it to him right yeah I'm I'm setting it hard um, but yes yeah. I, I will move it a little bit um, I, I find it difficult to go between fluke and tog to be honest with you because it, it's a totally different approach for me um, but I, I'm gonna be trying to set it hard through and the funny thing is I'll set it hard because you know you have to get through that really hard mouth I used to, Ed's jigs, you don't really get them through the mouth as often as you get them through the lip, which is awesome because these fish have such gummy lips. Once you get it through the lip, it's not it's not getting off and it's not tearing either. Um, you know, I the, the biggest one that I ever caught was through the lip. It wasn't through the mouth. It's not like I had to like get it out of that hard that hard spot in there. And it was it was not easy to get unhooked. So that's the one good thing for me when you have a tog is whether you get it in the lip or the mouth it's going to stay there hey and uh, i'll tell you the other nice thing about that hook is it's a heavy hook but it's not the heaviest hook in the world so you gotta and you gotta remember that um the the light the the smaller the gauge the hook the lighter the hook the easier it is to penetrate like a light wire hook is going to pierce skin easier than a heavy heavy hook so it's that trying to find that kind of you know in between fit and i haven't i i have not straightened one i haven't have not straightened one and that was all on that what is that hook i don't know what it is it's that funny shape thing yeah they're the super secret hooks yeah it's that funny shape thing <laughs> and it's it's not the thickest hook it seems it's sharp it's not you know, like i said it's, it's not the heaviest gauge wire but it's you know you you get a, a nice penetration and i haven't straightened it up you know I have not. I haven't straightened. The only time I've straightened them up is when I'm snagged in something and I've just pulled it straight. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, not from I a can, fish. I, same with me. The only time I've ever bent one of those hooks is when I was stuck on something and right. Uh, not from a fish. A straighten it. No, absolutely yeah. not. But it never went totally out of whack and totally went straight. Right. Um, I think my light rods would break before I'd straighten one of those to begin with. I'm not sure. It, John might uh, know. I've never tried. <laughs> John John likes to load up the rods on heavy stuff, so I, I it's fun. It makes me nervous. <laughs> it makes me nervous when John is snagged. I'm like Jesus. He's gonna move the whole freaking yeah. party. Yeah, I've I've bent the hell out of those Travalas, man, and it's they will get, they they will lay over for you, man. It's nice. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let let's talk real quick. A um, little bit about the reels and the drag. Uh, maximum drag that you want how you're setting the drag for them uh let's start off ed you want to talk about what you're using for the reel specifically and the and specifically the drag and what what weight you're looking for as far as reels go um i mean i have my my avid um it's the newer sxj 5.3 so it has the raptor drag um i'm really enjoying that one uh i mean i got a um, an accurist, I don't think it's going to be very good for Tog. It's just, um, I don't think it has enough power. It's like 14 pound max. So that's, that's going to be relegated to, to fluke. And then I have my battles, my pen battles. If I'm using a bigger, 
if I'm if I'm using a spinning setup for tog, I'm using a bigger rod. Um, so I'm going to be using like a four thousand, five thousand uh, size b- uh, battle. Right. Um, that's pretty much pretty much what I'm running is is either the the, the avid or the battles. And now one one other question: what what type of um, retrieval are you looking at? You, did you say it was a five three? Yeah, the so, avid's the. I don't remember. It's the SXJ 5.3. So. Okay. so that's going to so, be more of the, the slower reach. Well, that's actually still a pretty decent retrieve. Uh, Mike, what are you using on yours as far as, as drag and uh, the retrieve ratio? Um, it, it, I think they're like five, six. Some, I, man, I've gone through so many reels. I've got a shoebox with two freaking broken you know i love the travalas i always talk about the shimano travalas i love those rods but I, the shimano stratic i freaking hate the things i've been burned by shimano in their reels enough i'm done with them i've never tried the Daiwas. i know a lot of people like them but man i went back to the it's it's pen spin fishers 25s and 3500s on all of them man i just went back to it i can't you know I grew up with them. I always had them and it's just tried the different things. They break and I get, you know, the spin fishers, I go back to them. I love them. I like them. Just, yeah. they're, they're, they're not the smoothest feeling drag in the world, but they work for me. You know what I mean? They go. Yeah, and, they, and they're pulling this, but so, but your, your technique when you hook is you lift and hold high, right? So it's not, you're not, you're using the hook here. set, right? What's you're, that? You're using the hook set, and then you're holding it up real high to keep them out of the rocks. You're not necessarily yes. relying on the reel. No, no, I'm relying on the rod. Okay. And, I'm more, and... I'm, I'm more relying on the rod. I mean, I'm not putting a lot of, you know, they, you can get, um, spinning, you know, spinning reels now that with like the pen slammers, they've got up to like 33 pound drags or something like that. Right there's not a rod there's not many rods that can handle 33 pounds of drag but you know what i mean like yeah so i mean as far as setting my drag it's light but it's not you know it's i'm fishing light line 10 15 pound you know it's hard and, for me to put it together it's never i've never been you know when you ask me well i, I think, think that's about how it. that's how most people fish though you know it's well, you, mike's also, look, mike's also good too for when he sets the hook He'll like start to lift the rod and then he'll stand up in the kayak <laughs> in the waves. So like he'll add the rod and then his six foot, you know, frame into the whole That's thing. why I get away with those six foot three rods in the kayak. But you yeah. got like, you know, 76, 77 inches of reach. <laughs> it makes it easy. Yeah, I I watch you when we go out and it is it's funny. I mean, it is funny to watch you. I don't, I don't even know if you realize what you're doing, but I don't, that's why when he asked me questions, I have to really think about it. You are like so focused. And that's why I said, yeah. I noticed you hold the rod up, but to Ed's point, if you're not already standing, you, you jump up and you're standing. And, uh, for those that understand the fat dad thing, we don't jump up in kayaks and stand. <laughs> Mike no. is jumping up in a kayak and standing in an inlet. Um, and <laughs> don't do what leaning. i do yeah he's leaning he's moving the the trolling motor with his foot while he's you know balanced on one foot with a fish you know up off the bottom so it's uh but but yes okay so you're using the rod to clear the rocks john you're mm-hmm. using i believe the rod somewhat you bring it up to about halfway but then you crank hard to and use the gear ratio to pull it out so yeah, uh, well, we talking conventional or spinning, you know, that that goes back to a big factor, too. Um, if I'm using my conventional setup, I as I'm lifting that rod or uh, tog out of the rocks, I am cranking as I get it out. Yeah. Once I know I have that rod at that 12 o'clock mark, which is not what you want to do, but tog fishing is a different ball game. That's why these rods are built the way they are. Um once I make it to that point, that's when I'll bring that rod back down because I know I got it out. I got that 10 feet, you know, of movement because that's why they tell you seven foot. As you have that seven foot, as you're lifting up, you want to be reeling as you lift. That gives you that 10 foot mark as you go. That That's the whole scope 
of tog fishing is to get it out as quick as possible. So when it comes to the conventional setup, yeah, that that's what I'm doing. Spinning gear, no, I, I'm cranking as fast as I can, and that's why I change over to that uh, that BQ or the the BGMQ right. this year because they are what 26 pounds of drag. Like Mike said, it's a little overkill, but uh, for a size 3,000 reel, 26 pounds of drag and the gear ratio, I think it's like five two on it. So I mean that thing's gonna get it out quickly too. So, and it's thirty eight inches of line per crank. So, that's significant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I'm the one who's I'm gonna get five cranks on it, and then I I know it's gonna be five feet. That, you know that that's that's pulled in there plus uh, when I when I bring the rod back down. So, I mean it's gonna be pulling in almost three feet per crank. Um, so even if it starts pulling anything back out, I know it's still going to be clear. Uh, but the the drags that I'm looking at is 18 plus if I'm going offshore, and then if I'm if I'm inshore, I do like the Accurist inshore. The S3 has 18 pounds drag. I think that's fine for inshore. Now, I say that knowing that it is possible to catch a double digit inshore, uh, but it's not likely. So I'm comfortable using the the 18 pound drag on the accurist um i wouldn't necessarily want to use that for the sheep's head if i'm fishing for both at the same time but uh, you know for tog I'm, I'm i'm comfortable with that um you know sheep's head you could get well i guess it's new jersey you're likely to not likely but you have a decent chance of getting double digit fish every time uh so you got to be more careful with it so that's what I'm looking at. I, I do like the Accurist inshore, but I also use for bait casters. So it's the Accurist S3, and then I also use a Pen Squall 300, I believe. Um, and then the regular spinning reels I use, my good old cheap ones, the Pen Fierce 3, a Pen Pursuit 3, which is a $30 reel. That's been going now for three and a half years. Caught 40 plus inch uh, striped bass on it before. John thinks it's hilarious because I could buy uh, 25 of my reels before, uh, you know, just to equal one of his reels, <laughs> one of his $400 accurate reels. Yeah, I'll, I'll lose it. it. <laughs> I, I would lose it too. too. That's why I'll it. lose it too. I can't have nice things. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, he was, he was talking to Randy on Friday about uh, a setup. He's like, yeah, it's – you know, 500. And I was like, what, a new kayak? I'm like, Come on, man. Okay. He's like, that's just the real. And I'm like, oh, it's such a different world that you live in, John. Just <laughs> such such a different world than me. Because I, I know, I know, just like you said, Mike, I know I'd lose it. Uh, I would absolutely lose it. So that's why I don't even think about it. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think it's great because John absolutely loves the reels. I will. Um, somewhere's, uh, somewhere's in Apsican Inlet. If anybody finds it, it's yours. There's a nice OTI uh, pitch black with a, a 13 fishing Z3 on it. It's like a $200 rod and a almost $300 reel. It's there. Yeah. You can have it. 30 pound braid, fresh. It's yours. I lost it. Yeah. Might not be too fresh now, but you know. No, it's not. No, no, it's not. It used to be. That's why it you was, can have it. It was when it went in. It, it was. Uh, it when was it went so, in. Yeah, it was. It was real fresh. <laughs> All right, so we, we got to at least talk about one more topic before we, uh, we we play this whole thing out. Are there any specific spots that you feel are different uh, for spring tog fishing than, uh, than they are for the fall tog fishing, you know, fall and winter? When we're talking inshore specifically, are you noticing anything different? Are you looking for a different area? And again, people in the chat be interested to see your thoughts as well. Uh, and I, I think I'm going to start this off. I'm really not looking for much different, uh, but I will say that I'm going to be looking closer to the inlets at the beginning of at the beginning of the season if the water is still cold. But if it's warm, I'm going. I'm literally it's it's wide open. The same as when it it starts to open back up in the fall. I'm just going all through the backwaters. Any any thoughts on that, Ed? I totally agree with that. You see, so you're looking at the water temperature too. Yeah, I'm looking at water temps. I am. I'm gonna fish closer to the to the inlet, and 
for my my immediate area where I can get to quickly and easily, it's it's going to be closer to an inlet. So that's naturally where I'm starting. So you know, and then as 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 the season gets on and waters waters moving, I'll, I'll start looking further in the back. But I've had better luck towards you know towards the inlets. Gotcha, gotcha, Mike. What are you doing? Deep water. If it's still cold, I'm looking for deeper water, closer to the inlets, but deep water. You know, you can get summertime when it's warm, you can get bit almost anywhere along any jetty or any kind of bridge or anything like that. But um, that's just me. I, I could be totally wrong. It could be, you know, no rhyme or reason to it, just my idea. But I look for deep water in the spring. That's where I start, the de- as deep as I can find it in, so, inside. Okay. So that, that's a good point. There, there are several inlets where you're talking you have rocks and structure even bridges that are in 40 to 60 feet of water mm-hmm. um, just inside the inlet you're looking mm-hmm. at that or you're yep, just saying exactly. anything over okay so really yep. literally the deepest spot that you can find yeah okay all right we we have uh peter mentioning that they're not in the same foraging areas as in the fall so more heavy structure in this spring. yeah which makes sense now. And the other thing I will say that I've noticed is um, outgoing tide seems to be better when there's a lot of uh, warmer water coming from it from, you know, in the bay and stuff on that outgoing tide as it warms that water up from the shallower water pushing out that's been warmed up. That seems to make a difference. Well, then you got right. bait moving too. So. And you got the, well, yeah. And you got the you got bait all the moving, crabs but, getting pushed out. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. John, what are you going to be looking at? So as Peter said, you know, you're looking for something that has more heavy structure. So th- this goes back to more of a uh, biology type thing. They're getting ready to, to spawn. So they're getting looking for those spots to start laying dormant during that, that spawning season. After, you know, they get done spawning, they're going to lay dormant for the most part. So have that one here and there eaten. But um, that's why you're going to start looking for that structure and those bigger rock piles in deeper water. Um, for me, this is why April 1st every year I try to get out on a boat. That determines how am I going to fish the jetties? How am I going to fish the inlets? How am I going to fish from the kayak now that this will be my first spring on the kayak? Um, that's going to tell me where am I going knowing the water temps. Are we going 10 miles off? Or are we going a mile off the beach to go fishing for these, you know, tog on April 1st? If we're going a mile off, that tells me, okay, great. I can go anywhere I want. If we're going a little bit deeper, if we're playing anywhere from 60 to 120 feet of water, that's going to tell me I might have to wait till the second week of it, weekend of April, and I'm going to have to look for those deeper holes. So that that's that's my approach with this. Gotcha. Um it- You know, to Pete's point, one thing that I don't do in the spring um, is I don't fish the sod banks. Uh, And I haven't really thought about it in a lot of detail, but maybe that's because it it just isn't as heavy a structure as you're as you're going to get near those bridges and and the uh, the inlet jetties, especially, you know, a lot of these jetties people don't realize within five feet of the jetty, you're, you're in some of them, you're dropping down to 50, 60 feet. Uh, even though you can stand right next to the jetty in, the, in a lot of cases where it's, you know, maybe up to 10 feet there. Uh, so that's what I'm doing. So a question that, um, John, I don't know if you have any, does anyone have a leader they can show for those that are watching and not listening? I can make something up real quick if you give me a few minutes. Um, back to crabbing and fishing, though. What kind of leader setup are you looking for? Are you looking to do uh, a jig or a rig? And if you can answer that question, and then I could tie something up for you real quick. I mean, to touch on uh, just to, like if you're going to use a top jig straight, you know, tie your leader on. Um, I use an Alberto. Um, like you're an FG guy, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I like it. You know, I tie tie my tie directly. I tie my leader directly to my um, to my braid, and then mm-hmm. regular, you know, not to, no terminal tie, no terminal tie. Yeah, I don't do I ever use no no terminal. A lot of times I'll tie my leader real long from the beginning. An FG knot 
sometimes I might make the leader like eight feet long just because uh, I just want to keep cutting it down and keeping it fresh where the knot's at so it doesn't start to fray too much. So I'm not constantly putting a new leader on. Sometimes I'll make it real long. All right, I can I can show one right here. And John can't get upset because this is one that he actually tied that I still have on a tog rod. Let me see if I can zoom in here for those that are watching. Those that are not, I apologize. But let me see if I can zoom in on me. All right, let's see if I can get this in here. So here is, I don't know if you can see this. Let me try to get a little bit closer without breaking everything. So right here, you can see that you got the two hooks on there and they're on, this I believe is 40 pound leader on there. So we've got the two hooks rigged up, I'm trying to be very careful that I don't break this rod. Is that, that's, is that what they would call, what they would call like, what do they call a snafu rig or something like that? Yeah. With the two get, hooks? Let's get John. Uh, John, do you want to talk about this rig? If he's even, uh, if, he's, if he's even listening right now, um, John would be a good one to talk about this because this is one that he actually tied onto mine. So you can see you had the one snelled hook on the bottom. Yeah. You've got, you so got that's, the slide. That is your Belmar rig or your sweetheart rig, depending on how you tie it. Um, your best bet grabbing and fishing is to take a look on YouTube about how to tie a Belmar rig just because it's difficult. It's going to be hard to show on camera and explain on camera. Um, I would go and watch a video on it for sure. But again, I'm using that offshore. I'm not using that inshore. I'm tying a single snelled hook on the yeah. my leader inshore. There's no reason to have that double going on while I'm still in short. I, I agree with that. And, and I will say, I will say this right now. You're going to like gonna embed ten... that both those hooks in like a whole crab basically. Right. I, what I do is what, when you're running the, you know, sweetheart slash Belmar rig, um, right. And some people call it a slider rig too. I've heard them called like a snafu or something like that. With yes. the two hicks. Snafu is actually a completely different rig. Um, that basically has a dropper loop in the center. Okay. On two hooks on the outside with six, in, it's about six inches from that. that oh, I got you. Loop. I got you. I got you. And it has two snelled hooks. That way you can run that. Yeah. Same. So that's, that's what I've tied before then where you literally like, it's almost like it's just tying like a drop shot loop. And yeah. then you're going to put those two hooks onto that drop shot. Right, right. I got yeah. you. I'm not a big fan of those snafus. Um, I rather, much rather run those Belmars. Uh, right. Just because if one of the hooks goes, okay, well, now it's going to go after the other hook. As okay. opposed to, I, I just feel like it's more forgiving. Put right. it that way. Than that snafu. Yeah. Right. I, I want to point out right now that people will have different names for the same <laughs> the same for the same uh, thing right the same rig tie so just uh, and i'm going to recommend this go on youtube um there are some really good knot videos out there and but look it up by those names the snafu the sweetheart there's slider. a lot of things you could do you can oh you got to keep playing around too like i don't know if anybody's done it besides me but uh last year me and uh guy jacob and he can the kid can fish is that kid can fish and uh we were out and we were um fishing at one of the bridges and um they would not tog and they would not take the jig off the bottom i don't know what it was they wouldn't take the jig it might it could have been just of anything as simple as like a lot of silt on the bottom and they couldn't see the jig laying directly on the bottom but so we put a drop loop on and I got late. I, you know, took the jig off. I got lazy. I had a dropper loop already tied. I put that on and I didn't feel like reaching in my bag to uh, grab like a one ounce, you know, one or two ounce weight or whatever I wanted to use. And I took a one ounce jig, uh, tog jig and put that on my surgeon's loop at the bottom and used the tog jig as a weight. And I started, I had a couple times that I got doubles on that. But I started getting them on the jig, and I started getting them on the drop loop. It just gives you ideas. Just play around. You know what I mean? There's no 
right way or wrong way. There's always more than one way to skin a cat and you can always find a new way to do it. You know what I mean? I love the lazy fishing. I do stuff like that. Yeah, do you, we discover things that way. Like, I mean, it was cool. You got a jig, and it worked. It worked great, man. Like, you got them. It got them biting on the jig. It got them interested in the jig. But I had that dropper loop sitting there, and they were they were chewing on it on both of them, man. Yeah, may as well use it. May as well yeah. use it. So one thing I'm going to say with back to that comment where you're talking about there, Mike. Um, you know, sometimes you notice that jig bite is off, especially yeah. in shore, and it could be anywhere. Um, what I'll do is if, if I'm jigging, and I, I hate doing it, but what I'm tying up right now is I'll take a jig, and I'll run a trailer hook off that jig. Um, right, you're right. Right through the eyelet. You know, you, you run a, a nice 10-foot leader off of that eyelet with a, a snelled hook on the back of that. Um, then you sometimes you'll notice, and then you just put a hook on the back of that, and you're good to go. And there's the jig there. There's your trailer <laughs> hook. That'll cause that bait to float up a little bit higher right. than sitting on that bottom. That right. draws in sometimes. Um, oh, that's the Rhode Island record. Yeah, getting Rhode it Island up off the it. bottom. Yeah, uh, I hate it, but sometimes you got to do what you got to do. Hey, if it's catching me fish, I don't hate any of it. Yeah. You know? I agree. I agree. It doesn't matter. All right. Is there anything that we have missed, guys? Anything that uh, we should cover for those that are getting ready to go out? Or is this – I'm feeling like it's just, guys, you, you, we've already talked about it before. We've gone through some of the details. But the most important thing is just to get out there and start fishing the heavy structure from day one. Um, I think the bait was a, was an interesting thing. You know, people talking about the softer baits, the clam, the sandworms. I've never used sandworms specifically for tog. Maybe I'll, I'll give that a go. Like John said, shrimp is a very overlooked bait for up here. It's so, everybody uses it in the South. Everything in the world eats shrimp. I've caught a lot of trigger fish on shrimp. I've caught tog on shrimp in the summertime. And then, you know, sea bass like it, blowfish like it. Seems like Mike, anything will eat it. Mike, you got to agree with me on this, though. It has to be peeled and cooked, though. I don't know what it is. It's got. I don't be know. Crazy. See, I've gotten it on raw shrimp, and dude, I've always I said it with tog. For some sometimes reason, in the summertime, you can catch those big, big grass shrimp that are full of eggs, and there's no way you take that and drop that. That thing won't get bit. A big, like a big old fat grass shrimp or a big brown shrimp that we have. They're native here. We have them here. You know, I, that's what I use for perch all the time. Is the grass shrimp, but. There's no way they wouldn't bite that. There's no way. But you gotta, you gotta think this is fat dad fishing. So as long as they're peeled and cooked, and we have cocktail sauce, we can also have a <laughs> snack while we're fishing. I'm all right so with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Why, why don't we do this? Uh, why don't we just say? I know that we're all gonna get out. So why don't we find a day when we have multiples of us out together? I'll bring cocktail shrimp and raw shrimp. Okay. Right. Yeah. I'll, I'll, bring, I'll bring the raw. I'll bring the raw. John, you can bring the cooked. Mike, you bring the cocktail sauce. Listen, I'm going to the dollar yeah. store, like L said. I'm just going to get some dollar store stuff. Shrimp, yeah, Robin. Uh, Rehydrated <laughs> shrimp. Real, real quick before we break off, there are two things we did not talk about. And that is the actual leader material, monofilament or fluorocarbon. Um, and then we didn't talk about hooks either. Uh, that might be one thing we may want to just touch real quick before we head out a couple sure. minutes. Go ahead. As far as your 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 leader, um, Andy's pink. I don't know why. The pink dissipates quicker than the clear. Um, fluorocarbon, yeah, it's a little more abrasion resistant, but we're talking about fishing wrecks here. So you're going to be retying constantly and wasting a ton of money. So if you're going to do monofilament, I prefer the Andy's pink. Um, and when it comes to hooks, don't go cheap. Um, I've been using Gamagatsu. A lot of people have been yelling at me um, about it. One person had a stern talking to me about it, but we're not going to say his name. Um, I'm going to pick, I actually picked up the Tsunami Saltex Octopus hooks and the 4 I'm going to give those a shot this year. Um, yeah, I was told not to use them anymore. Um, Gamagatsu? I have yeah. a whole box of the octopus gamagatsus. I got like a thousand of them. Yeah, so I'm look. I'm open to trying different things, um, and I don't know who told you not to use them. I'll tell you they work. Doesn't mean they're the best, but they definitely work. 
which is the reason that I have. Again, what is it you don't like? Do you not like the hold on? Do you not like the octopus? The overall bend in the way the octopus hook is shaped, or do you not like particularly the gamagatsus? I don't have a problem with them necessarily, but everyone that I talk to, they're like, I've had so many gamagatsu hooks break on me, and they're uh, like, wait till the day you have the big fish on and that hook just snaps really right. and I, i'm waiting for it and they're absolutely right um, i can nine... i can understand that because they are a forged hook so forged yeah. metal is going to be more brittle it's going to be stronger but it's not going to bend it's going to break it'll snap i got whereas, you whereas like that's why we made the switch with the tog jigs they're going to bend and not break like a forged like hook. the black nickel will like a Right. That hook will do, right? Right. A lot and of I, the, the mustads are a forged hook. So for fluke yes. and striper, it's not a big deal. But when you're setting, basically setting the hook into a stack of bricks, you want something that's going to, that's not going to snap. Yeah. And I, I think Qua is one of those guys. He's probably one that can agree with. I think he's probably one of the guys that fishes owners. Um, and if you're fishing the owner's hooks, do not use the needle point. Because the needle point is shaved down, and that's what's going to snap. Um, so, you know, me, I'm not a big owners guy. I've had problems with owners, um, so I'm I'm going to try the uh, the tsunami saltex and see what they're about. I picked a couple packs of them up, and they look absolutely amazing. I'll say tsunami's a budget brand, but they put out some good stuff for the for the money you pay. You, you definitely get some decent gear. I will say this: their hooks are not cheap. Um, it was seven dollars a pack for seven hooks, so it's on the steeper side. But these hooks are flawless. I, I don't see any imperfection in them. You know, to the the point, I have a, a whole bunch of them. I mean, I just held one pack up that just was randomly sitting behind me. I don't use hooks for for tog. I mean, I showed you the rig that I had, and I told you John tied it because John got annoyed that I was using. Um, that I wouldn't use a rig and he tied, he tied his hooks onto my rod. So <laughs> I'm <laughs> a jig have, guy. Uh, I, I love the jigs. Um, that day, actually it was the boat that we were on. It was crazy because the jig guys, there can only be a few fish in the jigs cause they were crossing over everybody from front to back. See um, now that at that point you have to put the jigs away. You can't. Right. And that's and that's what we did. And John just grabbed the rod that I was using and tied a rig on it. So that's why it's still on there. <laughs> but I typically don't fish rigs unless I absolutely have to. Uh, but it, but then again, I'm mostly an inshore guy, kayak guy. So I, you know, I never have to use a rig on that. It's always yep. jig jigs for me. Yep. I like fish. I, I like fi I do like fish and rigs sometimes. I definitely do. Uh, especially for I've definitely, especially for other things like trigger fish and stuff like that. I prefer not to use a jig for trigger fish. Um, I don't know why I like a smaller hook. Number one, number two, I like to keep it higher up off the bottom, yeah. which will kind of tell you something about fishing for uh trigger fish if you're targeting them, you know what I mean? So I like something that allows me to keep it a little bit higher up. Um, but you know, if it's jigs, I like the hooks that are on those jaw breakers. And but I guess if I'm going to buy hooks, I like owners. Owner hooks have always, I guess, worked well for me. Never really tried. I don't know. I've never the Gamma Gatsus. I've used them. I never had any bad experience with them. I know Gamma Gatsu makes a bait holder um, circle hook, which is pretty cool. You don't see. I know Eagle. I think Eagle, Eagle Claw. Eagle Claw makes one as well. Gamma Gatsu's got one. So. That's kind of cool, but um, never really had anything negative happen to it. But uh, owner hooks are awesome, man. They're great hooks. They're they expensive, are. though. <laughs> They're not cheap. Extremely expensive. They are not cheap, but, you know, like Ed was saying about Tsunami, a budget brand. I'm about that budget brands. So something's a little bit cheaper and it works. I'm, a, I'm I want that, <laughs> you know. I'm right there with you. I spent enough money for the kayak and the gas to get down there now you know it's funny we went down on friday and i i spent well over a hundred dollars just to go oh, out crazy and man pedal around for a few hours it was worth it's it crazy. it was fun to get on the water and see guys see these guys yeah. you know but um yeah i i hear you all right so uh anything else that we've missed no i think we i think we pretty much covered the basics yeah I, I, I agree. John's quiet because he, he did bring up those last two points and he did talk about them. Um, I, I'm going to just throw the quick plug for Andy's. 
It is the cheapest stuff. It is mono. Um, mono has in different tests shown to be more resilient up against hard structure and sharp structure than fluoro. I don't care if you get mad at me or not. I'm just saying look up the research. Look up uh, through Salt Strong. They've done a lot of very scientific tests on it, and they have shown that mono is, mono leaders are actually more abrasion resistant than fluoro. However, fluoro is going to fade into the water better uh, than than mono is. It's got a much I forget what they call the factor, but it, it just disappears a lot easier into the water than any mono, including the pink. So just keep that in mind. It's a balance. I try out both. I personally use Andy. I don't have one freaking complaint from that thing. I also have the Seaguar, what is it, the blue label or the Seaguar, whatever it's called, the really expensive flora. It's like 25 bucks for a spool of it. I don't like it. Um, but I've tried both. Try the Andes mono if you want to go with the mono and, and see how it goes. In worst case scenario, you're out three bucks. I could be misled. Somebody on here, maybe Quaz on here, he might know. Is there a difference that I was told that monofilament has more of a tendency to float versus where fluorocarbon has more of a tendency to sink? Which if you're fishing vertical, and there's water resistance going on and current that's going to make a big difference. That's the old, that's that abrasion a little bit, but my understanding is was um, fluorocarbon is easier to keep down. I could be wrong. I could be misled. I don't know for sure. Maybe somebody could comment on that. Qua might know. I see he's on here. Yeah, I think the one thing to keep in mind is a mono at let's say a twenty pound mono liter versus a 20 Here. pound fluoro yeah. is is much thicker right. it's going to catch that current a lot more than than a right. fluoro so to that point you make a good point um yeah here he is if, fluoro sinks and mono floats that was what my understanding of what i was well, told was it doesn't it so, doesn't technically float that's why right it doesn't float it's more easier buoyant. to keep down that's like i had always said like if i'm fishing a leader um for anything, you know, obviously like if it's freshwater, hollow body frogs and stuff, it's straight braid. But if, if I'm throwing like spooks and stuff like that along and walk any kind of walking bait kind of surface, I always tie on a monofilament leader. Yeah. Might just, it might just be my, my, you know, crazy thing of this is how I do it. And this is what I'm going to do. Might make no difference, but that was just something I was always told about fluorocarbon versus monofilament. I think one point to bring up, and we talked about this this past week, uh, was sometimes it doesn't matter what the truth is. What matters is how you well, feel about it. Right, right, right. right. So, 100%, 100%. So you, everybody should have their confidence gear. They should have their confidence in lure. what they use. Yeah, and if you're confident with it, you're going to fish it that much better. So in a lot of cases, it doesn't matter if it's mono or fluoro. It doesn't matter if it's a bait caster. It doesn't matter if it's a, if it's a 32 or a 33 rod. It doesn't matter if it's an accurate or a pen. What matters is that you're fishing it confidently. You're out there knowing that you're going to catch the fish, not just hoping that you might luck into a fish, and that can sometimes make all the difference. So I think we'll we'll kind of leave it with that today. Go out there, be confident, use your gear, be confident in your gear, your places, your spots, your presentations, and just fish the hell out of the area. That's going to be one of the big keys for the cold the uh, the cold weather starts to these seasons uh, quite often. Now, TOG's a little different. It's cold water fish. Um, so actually, you know, it's, it's not, you know, it's not that big of a, a deal when you have 47 degree water for a TOG, which it will happily bite in 40. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. Guys, everybody tuning in, thank you so much for the patience with the start of this and the, the mix up in the time. We're coming back next week. And right now it's looking like we're going to have a guest on uh, and we're going to talk about some saltwater fly fishing. Um, so we'll be getting that announced and just confirmed this week. And uh, this this presentation here tonight, this discussion will be going up on the podcast on Thursday morning at 5 a.m., so just make sure you check that out if you just want to listen to something on the way to work and make fun of us, yell at us in your car, um, curse us for the stupid advice that we give or the opinions that you don't agree with. Have at it. Have fun. <laughs> and uh, in the meantime, Mike, thanks for stopping by. Thanks, thanks, man. I'll be hearing you tomorrow morning. I'm still going in on the uh, on the uh, 
Oh, the, the lessons there. You've been you, you've been my ride in in the morning. So uh, that's that's oh that's terrible. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it is, man. I'm dreading. I have to hear you tonight. It's yeah, uh, yeah I'll, I'll mention real quick with the flounder course. Um, it's I I'm very happy to say I got another uh, couple of reviews in. It's still five stars, five out of five. It, it's th it's it. thorough. It is informative. It is very informative. It, it definitely is. I mean, even what just goes into you just learn something about your environment and where you're at and what you're around. It, it's good. It is good. It is very good. I appreciate you're, it. You're a smart feller, man. No doubt. It, it's it's <laughs> meant to be helpful. Um, it's funny though. There are there are several people that finished it but didn't do the survey too. So I don't know what they're thinking. There's actually one in the chat. I'm looking at your name right now, buddy. He's going to ruin it. He's going to put a four star or three star. He's going to ruin it for me. Just because. <laughs> <laughs> Just point. because. Right. Right. <laughs> um, so that is still out there available. I'll put a link in this description tomorrow. Um, if people want to get in there, there's still a preseason sale going on. But after that, I'm not going to be focused on the course as much. Um, so it's going to be a regular price for pretty much most of flounder season. So if you want to get in on it uh, ahead of time, uh, you can just go to you can go to fatdadfishing.com. There are links on there, and it's $125 off. So, again, everyone, thanks for checking us out. We'll be back next week with a really cool episode that I'm looking forward to, saltwater fly fishing. And we're going to talk a little freshwater, too, because that's what this uh, this guest does. And uh, he's very, very good at it, somebody that we definitely want to hear from. Not going to announce the name until we get the final confirmation this week. Um, but in the meantime – Get out on the water, take advantage of the open seasons. You got the winter flounder, you got the striped bass, and we got this tog coming up. So get out there, get tight lines, and uh, good luck to y'all. I'll catch you next week.